Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, if you want to turn with me to James 1. And James, I love the book of James. It's so practical, isn't it? Just for godly wisdom and living. And, and James himself, the, the one that the scholars say that wrote this book, he was actually one of Jesus' brothers, And it's really interesting because during Jesus' ministry, it actually says that none of his brothers believed in him. They didn't believe that he was the son of God. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And you can see that in John 7, 5. It says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. And that word brothers is meaning like from the womb because in the Bible it talks about, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. But this brother where it's referring to here that even his brothers did not believe him is actually like a brother from the womb a a bloodline and we're talking on Wednesday like imagine if Jesus was your brother (laughs) growing up in the house (laughs) you can imagine that and it was pretty funny people had some funny analogies you know would he never be getting into trouble (laughs) would you always always be getting the blame because he was so good (laughs) and Jesus with James Jesus actually appeared to James post-resurrection. And, you know, when he appeared to James, you know, his life from that moment was forever changed. Imagine that. He's someone that you grew up with proclaiming to be the son of God. He went around preaching, doing miracles, signs and wonders. And suddenly, you know, he dies three days later. He rose, he's rose again. But then post-resurrection, you actually get to see him. Imagine that. And it says that his, you know, his, his life was changed forever after that. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 6 to 7. It says, after that, after Jesus' resurrection, resurrection, it's meaning, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. He was seen by over 500 brethren. You know, for someone that didn't believe and then they've seen Jesus post-resurrected, 500 witnesses and then by James and all the apostles. Quite incredible, isn't it? And James was actually also one of the early leaders in the church in Jerusalem. So that's just a little bit about James. So he's the one that's writing this letter in James 1.1. And so if we just want to go to James 1.1, if you have it in your Bible, it says, James a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered aboard greetings. And it's really interesting, I think, this language. When you look at this, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he could have boasted about a lot of things. You know, he had the bloodline to Jesus. Jesus was his brother. He could have said, brother of Christ. He could have said, Um, you know, a leader, one of the first leaders in the church, but he's actually calling himself a bondservant, and a bondservant is actually a slave, and it implies someone who's absolutely devoted to his master, And, and for Christians, it's implying someone who's absolutely devoted to Jesus, and, and the bond servants, they've basically dedicated their entire life to their master, and they refuse to be released from serving them. So I think it's quite incredible that James here is saying, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the 12 tribes which are scattered aboard, greetings. You know, he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered ab- abroad because these were like believers who had actually been persecuted in the Christian church and they'd had to flee, so they were scattered. And, and he's writing this letter to encourage them to say, don't give up, don't, don't quit when you're facing something Difficult, or your circumstances are difficult, and you've been scattered and had to flee, like just to be encouraged. And that's who is writing this letter to, and it's also relevant to us today. And he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Like, count it all joy when you face trials. It says, count, but count it all. 
Count it all. Count it all joy when you. Notice it says when, not if. I'm sure if you've been around long enough, like we've all encountered difficult circumstances and trials and, and testing, and you know, they're going to come. You know, the trials will come. But it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing. Knowing what? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Knowing. You know that when you go through a trial, the testing of your faith is going to produce patience. And that word patience is actually meaning um, um, an endurance, a steadfastness. Your Bible may even say steadfastness. An endurance. You know, when faith is tested, it actually does something within us. It actually stirs up the ability within us to endure. And endurance, it's what is needed, like this type of endurance. In this scripture, it's talking about the endurance you need, like when you're, you're running a marathon. You know, that takes great physical stamina and strength when you've got to finish a marathon. You know, it's endurance. It's getting through without compromise or wavering or just thinking, oh, I'm going to give up. This is too tough. It's pressing on. It's that endurance, that ability just to keep going, to keep going on. And verse 4, it says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm sure you ask anyone here today or Anyone that you know that, that you consider strong in their faith, someone that's gone through some trials and some testing, and you ask them, how did you get through the most difficult times in your life? How did you do it? How did you manage to endure? And you know, the key for those people, when you speak to them, it says they did it by actually learning how to rely on God and knowing that God was with them, to be able to trust God in those storms. And it's a hard lesson, and sometimes we think, oh gosh, I wish, wish I learned that earlier how to lean into God, how to trust God through these seasons rather than trying to do it all myself and taking everything on myself and feeling so overwhelmed, you know, because sometimes that test and that trial is difficult. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the first reaction can be to blame God or to become really discouraged. But James is saying, count it all joy when you face various trials, knowing that those trials will actually produce patience. It's going to produce an endurance. It's going to stir up something nothing else can by going through that trial. And trials, I've actually got here in my notes, they actually make us more God-dependent. You know, we don't have all the answers that so begin to cry out to God because suddenly it just looks so impossible that we have to look to God. And it's through the difficulties and the trials and the testing that we grow and mature and we learn how to become less reliant on self and more dependent on God. And, you know, and, and we don't grow and mature when things are comfortable. You know, we love being comfortable. <laughs> we love having things around us to make sure we're really comfortable. And it's so good having those things. But at the end of the day, it's never going to get you to a place of spiritual maturity. We actually need to go through the trials and the testing. That's how we will grow in our faith. That's how we will mature in the things of the Lord. And you know, this week I was um, going to go and have a cup of tea because it's quite nice to have a calming cup of tea <laughs> during your work day, I find. And in our house, we, we, have, we always have like extra strong tea because I think Ronald kind of likes the strong builder's tea, you know, the strong cup of tea. Anyway, I, I went to go and get the tea out of the little thing and there was none left. And so I got the box out of the pantry and I was opening it up to put it in. And on the box, it actually had the words proper strong. <laughs> and I thought, now, this is the real British tea. It's proper strong. And I was actually thinking about that, um, thinking, oh, how's this going to be different? And you know, at the end of the day, a tea bag in itself, it's pretty useless without the hot water. You know, it's pretty useless. And it's only when it's actually in the hot water that tea bag is going to reach its purpose and, and its potential for what it's created for. And you know, and the longer that it's in the hot water, the better it becomes, the more fragrant, the more flavoursome. And there's a, a famous quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, and it says, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And it's so true, isn't it? We don't know what we're capable of until sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of a trial. And, you know, as Christians, we don't know what we're made of until we go through some hot water, you know, some testing, some trials. But you know, we can be proper strong. <laughs> you 
you know, we, but we've got to go through some hot water to bring out the best, the best that's in us. And, you know, you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ because that's who he says you are. You know, this box of tea on it, it said it was proper strong. So I'm like, okay, this is proper strong tea. And it's just like you. The Lord says that you are more than a conqueror and you are more than a conqueror because that's who the Lord says you are. That whatever you're facing at the moment, whatever the battle is, whatever the circumstance, if it's so difficult, if it seems overwhelming, you need to know today that count it all joy because the Lord is doing this because there's some things you need to be able to endure the rest of the battle and you're only going to learn them during this time of trial and testing. You know, we only grow during that season of trial and testing. And I've been thinking a lot lately, you know, what is the prize for us as a Christian, as a believer? Like, what is the prize? What is the prize? You know, what are we chasing in this life? What are we pursuing? What is the most important thing when we get to the end of our lives? What's going to matter? What's the prize? What is the prize? Is it meeting Jesus face to face and hearing, and hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant? You know, do we fight the fight of faith? Because I look at those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It's a walk of faith, isn't it? That the Lord's commanded us to be faithful in all that we do. You know, to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, to remain steadfast in our faith, not wavering. You know, we're saved by faith and not works. It's nothing about us, but it's all about what God has done for us. But we've got to walk in that. You know, and without faith, it says it's impossible to please him. And I think no wonder the enemy wants us to give up and to quit and to get our eyes off the Lord and be overwhelmed by the things that surround us and invade our lives because faith has to look at God. And the moment that we're not looking at God, we're looking and focusing on our circumstance and our situation. We need to walk by faith. It's well, good, good, well done, good and faithful servant. And so what is the prize for you when you come to the end of your days? What is going to count? What's going to matter? You know, if you feel like giving up, it's not a time to give up because the Lord's got things for you. And that prize is meeting our Saviour face to face. Nothing else is going to matter. You know, and we actually, we're on the winning side, right? We know it ends. <laughs> and in Hebrews 12, if you have your Bibles, it actually talks about the race of faith. And it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's the ones that have gone before us. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. And then that joy was you. He knew the freedom that, that you would have through what he was doing, that it was worth it. That price that he paid was worth it. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, that's, that's a really well-known passage of scripture. But you know, it's key, and Sharon touched on it this morning as well, looking unto Jesus. That is a key. If we want to get through things, we've got to keep our eyes on the prize. <laughs> We've got to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who has gone before us, and, you know, and his position has never changed. He is the same, and he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And it says he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, God isn't pacing around the throne room wondering how it's all going to work out for you. He's not worried going back and forth, it actually says he's seated on that throne. And, you know, and when an earthly king actually comes into a room and he sits on the throne and takes that seat, you know, everything in that room comes straight into order, straight away, as soon as he sits down. You know, and that, that being in that seated position, it signifies rest and confidence. And you know, he's seated on the throne. Jesus is seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father, and we can be at rest trusting that God has everything under control, under control. When we try and take back the burdens and everything that's going on, that's when confusion and unbelief sort of sets in. We try and take back everything upon ourselves rather than just trusting God and giving it to him and trusting him in the journey and trusting him in the circumstance and trusting him 
that you're going to get through the things that you're facing. God allows circumstances in our lives to work a godly maturity in us and and how we respond is, is our choice. James is telling us to count it all joy when we face trials because we know whatever comes our way, successes, failures, it works a character of God in us. Endurance, steadfastness, patience, perseverance. You know, if we want to finish the race, we've got to have all of these characteristics in our life. We've got to learn how to endure. We've got to learn how to keep our eyes on the prize, to keep the focus on the Lord, to run with endurance. No compromise, no wavering when time gets tough. Just how to push through, how to press into the Lord. And you know, in life, when you get these lessons, when you first get some trials and testings, it's really difficult. But when you come to that same situation again, when you've actually passed that test or gone through some things, it's easier, a little bit easier. But, you know, we've got to count it all joy, knowing that the Lord is with us and he's gone before us. And he's going to produce something good out of whatever we're going through. James 1, 5 to 8. This is the second part here of James' letter. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, as he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You know, this James is saying here that if, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And it says he will give it liberally. He will give it without reproach. He's not going to scold you and say, oh, you've just been so unwise in that situation. He's saying, ask. Ask the Lord. But sometimes when we've got stuff going on, it's so easy to go to other places, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to read this self-help book. Oh, I'm going to go and listen to this. Oh, I'm going to go and watch this on YouTube. But the Lord's saying, just come to me, ask, and I'll give you wisdom for that situation. He'll give you wisdom on how to get through, and he'll give it liberally. And it just says when you ask to, don't be undecided or half-hearted or wavering because it makes you unstable. Be confident in what the Lord has promised and who he is. James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life is promised to him who remains faithful You know, we can be easily discouraged during trials, but James says, count it all joy and see it from God's perspective that something good will come out of it. And in the book of Daniel, there's a lot of books actually written about that particular book and about Daniel and his life. But Daniel, you know, we know that he sought the Lord in prayer and and he fasted and he waited for like 21 days for that answer to come. And later at the end of that time, it was revealed to um, Daniel by an angel of the Lord that that angel was sent. On that first day he prayed, it said they heard that prayer of Daniel and that angel was dispatched to come to try and help him. But that angel, because it was a spiritual battle, it took 20 more days 21 days for him to get the answer and he had to call upon the Archangel Michael to come and help fight that battle. And that was the thing that held up the answer for Daniel. But imagine if Daniel decided to quit, that it was too hard and he decided on day five, I'm going to give up. This is too hard. Lord, you haven't even heard my prayer. What about if he he quit it on day 14 or day 20 and that answer was just about to come? And we've got to understand that sometimes these battles that we face, you know, there's... there's, um, uh, principalities and power, like that spiritual realm, you know, that, that's the battle. And when, when we pray, we're not to stop praying. We're to pray without ceasing because the Lord hears our prayers and answers our prayers. And I just really want to encourage not to give up. If you've been praying for something for a long time, you might say, oh, Kim, well, 21 days for him, but I've been praying like for most of my life for something else. Don't give up. Keep pursuing God. Keep pressing in. Keep praying, keep believing. You know, God loves you. He knows all of our failings, but he still loves us. 
and he chased after us. He pursued us when he came to earth as a man and he died for our sins. And he says, come to me, you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He will give us rest when we come to the Lord. In Philippians 4, 6 to 7, it says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. I love that passage of scripture and there used to be a song and it used to say, I'll be anxious for nothing, I'll trust in you and I'll pray and all of heaven will hear my cry. And it says, and the peace of God which falls on me will guard my heart and my mind. And that's the thing, when the peace of God comes, it'll guard your heart and your mind so your mind's not running around to a million different places, but you can find rest and peace when you begin to trust in the Lord. It's a peace that comes that doesn't make sense because if you look at the natural, it's like everyone else would be saying you should be feeling turmoil. How can you feel peace in the middle of that storm? But it's a peace that comes from the Lord when we trust him. John 14, it says, let not your heart be troubled. You know, why does James say to count it all joy when we face trials? Why does he say that? Because trials produce something in you that nothing else can. It's an endurance, it's a perseverance. And I said before, we love being comfortable. We love it. You look at all the um, sales and the advertising at the moment to make your life more comfortable. You need this and this and this. <laughs> you know, instant life. Get all these new apps. But, you know, live that life of comfort. But the thing is, if you chase after the dream of comfort in this world, it's not going to deliver what it promises. You won't be comfortable in the end. You know, you will not get to a place of spiritual maturity and know how to stand and remain steadfast no matter what if you don't go through a few trials. And James isn't saying that we've got to rejoice in the trial like great, there's another trial, but he's just saying rejoice that God is with you in the midst of the trial and knowing that out of that thing it's going to produce something in you. It's going to grow you in your faith and your character and your endurance. And, you know, that, that's the hope we have as an anchor for our soul is in Christ. Hope is an anchor, secure. We don't have to be wavering and going all over the place. We're grounded. We're standing rock solid. Amen. God is with us. He is for us. Pursue God knowing you'll be able to endure to the end and turn your eyes upon Jesus like he is the prize. So let us look to him with endurance. You know, we're not fighting a losing battle and we've got to know that God has purposed good things to come out of the storm, whatever it is you're facing. 1 Peter 1, 4 to 9 is talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. And his resurrection, and it says, I'll pick it up here in verse 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold, though it perishes through though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's the prize. That is the prize. And you know, it says... You know, the Bible says in a lot of places that, that our lives, they're more precious than silver, they're more precious than gold. But even gold has to go through that refining process, it has to go through the heat. And when that heat's applied, you know, the impurities, it rises to the top and it gets sloughed off. And it's like our life, when we go through the fire and the trials and the testing, you know, we're, we're purified, it's a purifying process. And it's actually to make us more like him. And to show us that there's something within us that God's created within us. There's a strength that he's put in there to endure. And we don't know until we face it in things that just what God has placed there, like what we can actually do. It's like that quote, 
You never know what you're capable of until you actually find yourself in some hot water, <laughs> like a tea bag. But God's made us proper strong, amen? <laughs> He's made us proper strong, and I just really wanted to encourage you this morning. That's the word that the Lord put on my heart. And I just want you to encourage that whatever it is you're facing, just to know that the Lord's with you in this and that something good will come out of it. Amen? Because he loves you. He loves you. But that's all his refining process so that we can carry with us the endurance that we need to finish the race. So we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm-hmm.